the record on this computer. Excellent. So what we will do is we first do a little bit of refresher on, um, on collections, and then uh, we move on to a more theoretical topic on uh, programming paradigms. So first question to you, what is a collection? So we, we had a collection, you know, on Monday. Uh, so that should be quite straightforward for you to do. Um, so what do you think is a collection? Why do we have this concept? And, you know, what comes to mind when um, someone who is, you know, let's say, beginning in programming asks you, okay, what is all this collection business? What what are collections for or what they are? Yeah, some, some um, ideas. So it is a sort of data structure, yes. It is a way to organize and structure, yeah, so code and data, right? So we are organizing data such that we can use certain constructs from code to manipulate this sort of structured data. Um, bunch of values, yeah, connected through some, some way. Those are all good answers, but they are kind of, not, yeah, you know, not precise. Like if somebody who is not programming Ask you, okay, explain to me, like, what is a collection? Um, yeah, you, you will have kind of hard time convincing them with those answers, like what it actually is, right? You, you all feel what it is, you all know what it is because you've been using collections, um, but it's kind of hard to explain it in a, in a concise way. Like, um, why, why do I have this slide? And why do I make you to sort of write what is a, a collection? Um, part of the exam is testing your skills about uh, programming. So how can you express certain constructs in uh, programming languages? But part of the exam is kind of testing your ability to reflect and to be able to explain. So you can expect questions like this, um, where you have to, in English, you have to explain something that you intuitively know or intuitively have been using for a while. Uh, so this is to kind of stimulate your better and deeper understanding of some of the constructs. So I'm not gonna tell you what is a collection, let's drill, drill further. So let's use an examples. So you can explain to somebody what something is by just giving examples. So what collections do you often use and what sort of characteristics do they have? So the, on the previous slide, there was like, I, I think there was a, a vector mentioned. So what else? What, what collections do you often use? Arrays, lists, vectors, map, excellent. So those are very common uh, collections that we use. Um, Q, good. Some more. Three, very nice. Maybe one more. Struct. Heap. Very good. So um, heap or stack, right? So we have those are kind of the, the most typical. Um, we can have variations on them. So for example, we can have binary trees or we can have trees which are sort of uh, arbitrary number of children. We can have linked lists and we can have array lists, right? So a list can be um, kind of organized by attaching uh, elements kind of next to each other. And then it can be all over the memory. So linked lists are kind of like that. Or you want to have a homogeneous kind of a area of memory and you want this to be kind of representing your list. And then we usually backing up the list with, with sort of like a continuous block of memory 
and then we sometimes say it's an array list. Uh, so we can have different implementations of those uh, collections. Uh, for stack, uh, stack is very common. There is a lot of uh, benefits of using stack in programming languages. Uh, you know, you all you you all know stack and heap uh, when when you're programming on where the variables go and so on. And the idea is that you're adding things on top and kind of uh, consuming things from from top. Uh, when I was doing my um, yeah, when I was doing my PhD, actually, I needed like a stack based machine and I needed a very fast implementation of a stack. And I, I you know, I was doing uh, my PhD in the ancient times and uh, Intel released an MMX processor. And that was kind of really cool because you could have access to registers which were 128 bits or 256 bits long. And that's amazing on a, you know, a 16 bit architecture because I could fit many, you know, many integers of length 16 bits inside the register, which was 256. So then I wrote my own kind of a stack um, implementation, which was using those long registers to keep the values. And then when you keep like, you know, if you add a couple of values and then you need to do operations, all those values were on the single register. So kind of reading and writing was a single operation. I, like, even though you were operating on like up to eight or more uh, for 256 or up to 16 um, values, it was still a single kind of register. Uh, if you overflow, then you have to deal with it, right? Because then you have to go to RAM or you have to go to another register, uh, but up to the certain length, the operations were amazingly fast. And I was uh, beating C implementation by a factor of, I think, 25 or something. Um, if you implement stack naively in C and use just normal RAM for it. So all of those are kind of like good abstractions and you can have variations on what they can do or how they can be implemented. So, okay, that's a weird slide. What is that slide for? Oh yeah, so it's kind of summarizes uh, <laughs> what are the typical collections. So we have strings. Uh, so you didn't mention strings, but uh, strings themselves are the most common collection that we use almost in all programming languages, right? Um, vectors, yeah, they, they have been mentioned, uh, maps or hash maps. And then we have some kind of a concept of generics. Uh, Carl covered it uh, earlier. And this topic becomes very um, relevant when you're discussing uh, collections or when you're discussing kind of a programming in a way that abstracts the underlying type. We've been doing a lot of generics in Haskell, actually. So programming kind of in a generic way in Haskell is very natural because you can just abstract your type uh kind of naturally we often did that without even thinking oh yeah we're doing generic programming right in this function um so all the you know various things that we programmed on lists we didn't care what type of the list it was because the operations were sort of universal so you are using kind of a generic programming to program for example um you know picking up the the head or the tail or whatever we've been doing manually for the first assignment, all of that was generic programming. So in many programming languages, including Rust, generic generics or in C++, uh, you know, uh, metaprogramming with templates, generics are kind of very kind of a black art. Uh, in Haskell, yes, we've been doing it from day one. Like uh, it's very natural and very intuitive uh, because the type system really helps you there, right? So there are just a couple of, um, uh, summaries of the of the previous cloud uh, word cloud about the collections. So why we use them? What they are used for? You know, could we skip using them? Yeah, another hard hard question, right? You have to sort of uh, say in English what, you know, you intuitively know uh, and what you intuitively use.
Yes, exactly. So oh, th those are good answers. Um, so we maybe the word visualizing is kind of um, may maybe is more like about conceptualizing, right? It's sort of visualizing and being able to communicate with others of how the data is represented and how we operate on it. So when, for example, when we use list and I tell you, oh, let's use a list of students, then it's it's kind of immediate kind of common understanding of what we mean and what properties of this data structure will have. Um, let's, because, uh, you know, if I say we will have a stack of students, then, you know, oh yeah, so we will be adding on top and kind of uh, taking from top and you kind of, again, kind of vi visualize or conceptualize, you know, immediately what could happen to this data structure, uh, making to work easy with data sets, um, storing value efficiency efficiently exactly so as we were discussing before the difference between using linked list or array list depends what you're dealing with so if your list contains you know images which are i don't know one megabyte two megabytes long uh, maybe doing a continuous um, memory allocation for all your images in your ram is not a good idea because you don't really need it a uh, linked list would be much better because then, you know, you can have um, allocation all over the place and you kind of navigate yourself through the previous and, uh, and next um, pointers. But if you have some sort of numerical data and you're doing some calculations, then using a linked list would be extremely inefficient because you cannot kind of read it in a single uh, um, read operation and keep the kind of a con continuous values in, in cache lines. So then you want to kind of represent it properly. Um, so same with games, yeah. So there are certain uh, metaphors or abstractions that kind of align what you need to achieve with the way of thinking. So collections are very useful and we could you know, go without them, but we would need to sort of do a lot of things manually and they are very um, robust and very reusable abstraction. And they exist in all programming languages, right? So some programming languages have much more um, support for collections. Some have less, but all of them have some form of support for collections because it's a very useful metaphor and very useful way of thinking about your underlying data. Um, so, you know, we have more complicated collections, like for example, uh, red black trees or things like this, which again add additional kind of semantics to what we do and how we handle data. All right, so what functions on collections do you know from different programming languages? So what can you do on collections? Um, just list functions. Name name of functions. Yeah, those are good for stack. I had to implement them when I did my uh, stack based implementation on the registers. Uh, these days, you can really do a lot you have access to those really long um registers out of the box i had to use those special mmx instructions and i in my c code i had to have this assembly because i couldn't kind of get to those registers like in any other way uh, so i had to have some bits of code written in assembly such that i can take advantage of the architecture I was running on manually and say, oh yeah, this, this thing is on, on particular register. Uh, len, head, append, tail, yeah, push back, push front, sort. What else can you do on collections? Come on, you, you can come up with a couple of more functions, you know. I, I hope um, Carl was talking about it. Yeah, resize, yeah, but there are more obvious ones.
Okay, let's go. Push. Yes, we've had that. What else? Okay, you keep thinking of the functions. The square brackets, yeah, the list comprehensions, right? What else do you know? Map, yes, exactly. You have a map. That's a very useful collection function. What else? Filter, exactly, yes, reduce. Uh, those are really good functions which you can make your code kind of compact. Um, zip great what else you know all of them right by you know by the end of this course you know all of those functions what else what else we spend some time in haskell on fmap yeah but another one which was causing some a little bit of problems some people love it some people hate it Fold, yeah, exactly, I was waiting for the fold. So we have folds, we have left folds and right folds and some languages just have one, uh, the default one, uh, like in Rust. Great, so all of those are good, useful methods on collections. Uh, if you were coming from C++, you probably were not using many of those. Uh, even though C++ do have support for collections, they, tend to be a little bit not that used that often. Uh, whereas in uh, some programming languages, we use a lot of those naturally. For each, yeah, that's a good one as well. So for or for each, we will come back to this in, in a minute. All right, so, so that's great. Uh, so how about you order the programming languages based on the... Uh, based on the word cloud or function cloud that we had on the previous slide. So if you were to sort of rank uh, what functions have been using or have, you know, you have been familiar with in those programming languages, then what comes to mind? It's a little bit perception based, right? As I said, like C++ do have um, most of those functions, but we tend not to use that that much. Um, yeah, Go is not that that great with collections. Uh, you have some of those functions, but not many. Yeah, so the, the, the question is a little bit biased because it asks, have you used, right? Uh, so it depends on your, uh, how much you, you've coded in a particular programming language. Um, so I've coded, uh, let's say I've coded uniformly across all those programming languages. So I would say I've used Haskell the most, like most of the functions I've used was in Haskell. Um, C and C++, C is probably the lowest, uh, and C++ is a bit low as well. Go is quite low. Uh, JavaScript and Rust are quite high. Uh, they do have those uh, functional collection functions that you can use, and in Rust especially, Rust has almost all the functions that we've used in um, uh, that we've used in Haskell. The, the thing is that in Rust, you can either do it imperatively, like in loop manually, doing things uh, manually, or you can chain those uh, collection functions kind of in a functional style. And most people who come from imperative programming, they tend to not use the collection functions the, the way they are kind of in the API, and you need to know about them. But if you're coming to Rust from Haskell and you know about all those functions, about folds and maps and blah, 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 then you are kind of happy because they naturally exist in Rust and you can use them. So I would kind of rank those two higher than you, and but Haskell would be kind of on top as well. 
uh, and those three would be quite low um, because uh, the, I, you know, especially in Go, I tend to do almost everything through you know loops. Um, I don't use fancy things like folds or and so on unless you know you kind of prepare the infrastructure for yourself uh, to to take advantage of that. All right, so this is um, this is fine. Uh, let's move on and let's talk a little bit about programming paradigms. So the, the thing about this comparison and this kind of um, feel of the programming language and the uh, way you sort of expressing yourself is a little bit difficult if we don't have a, a kind of a vocabulary and if we, we don't have a common understanding to discuss it. So let before we start, I have... Um, I have prepared um, a small demonstration. So let's see Visual Studio Code, new window. All right. So let's say a new file, select language. We will pick C. All right. So let's make it a, a little bit bigger. So not to type it myself uh, in the class, I kind of typed it already. So I will copy this. So a quick uh, code comprehension. What does this uh, code do? What does this code do? Yeah, so your task is to explain what is this code doing? It's very trivial. We're using collections. Uh, we're using a vector and a string, a BOVA type, you know, correction. And we initializing it with some values. And then we iterating over it and printing it to the standard output, right? So the program is composed. Yeah, so the program is composed of <clears throat> um, sort of uh, three steps. That's right. So Friedrich and, and Thomas are, are correct. Uh, it basically prints, hello, beautiful world. Uh, and it is it has kind of a three stages. So the first stage is the initialization. Uh, so we're initializing our data structure. Uh, then we are using the data structure to interact with the standard output. And then we are finishing it by printing the final end of line. So the, the words are kind of in line separated by space. And then we are finishing it with the end of line. So there will be an end of line at the end, right? So we have those three stages. So do you like this code? Do you feel this code is, is nice? Or do you kind of feel, I mean, it's very simple code, right? So it doesn't really matter that much. But in programming, all those small details accumulate. So if you have, you know, 10,000 lines of code, and each of those lines has this kind of a little bit of a smell, with 10,000 lines of code, the, the code is, becomes unmanageable, right? So even though you may see, I don't really like this code, but I don't care. I mean, it's so simple that, you know, fixing it doesn't make much sense. I would agree with you, but it's just a demonstration, right? It's a very simple demonstration of something that we should pay attention to and don't do. Uh, but in this particular example, yeah, you can say, yes, it, you know, it's just nitpicking, right? But what, what do you don't like about this code? Tell me. I don't like uh, two things about this code. <laughs> right. So the, the first thing is uh, we don't need a vector because this is sort of a fixed length uh, data structure. Uh, and we may not need to be expanding it, right? Um, that's true. So we could use just array here instead of a vector. Uh, so that's one thing. And if V is empty, it will crash. Yes, correct. Very good, good spotting, right? We don't do, we kind of jump straight into the, the loop 
And if we, because as I told you, the, the code has like a three stages. So the first stage is initialization of the data structure. And if that one was empty, this code would fail. So there is a very tight coupling between those two things, which makes this one unsafe. Because if this one is empty, this one will crash. Very good. Uh, so what else you don't like? Okay, so let's, why not use a for loop? <laughs> Excellent point. So let's say, uh, new file. How do you open a new file in this uh, file, new file? Perfect. And we do C++ again, and we do my second example which is using a for loop. All right, so let's do this one. So this one is, uh, it's, you know, your normal C++. <laughs> uh, the initialization is the same. Uh, we kind of using vector because um, when I, started coding it, I actually started just with hello and then I've added extra words. So it was growing when I was coding it. So let's assume the requirement is that this data structure can be resizable such that you can add more words, let's say from configuration file or from a user, right? So that part uh, is sort of um, initialization comes, uh, but we do need to use vector because we don't know upfront how many things we will kind of do. So let's assume using array here is not desirable. So we will use vector and we converted it to now to a for loop, right? So now the for loop is safer. If X is zero, then this, this condition will not be fulfilled, which means we're not gonna crash. Um, but it can still be improved. Uh, why? Why I, I don't like this code and why you might not like this code? Any ideas? So, I mean, this code is like, you know, it's a standard C++ code. There is nothing uh, fundamentally broken with it. It's just that it is kind of fundamentally broken by design. <laughs> uh, so th there is a, a small problem with, you see, um, I have a data structure and I have to do something with it, right? And here again, I have a data structure and I'm doing something with it, right? So let's have a look how this code looks in, high, in, in Haskell. So this code in Haskell um, looks like this map print and then hello beautiful world okay so this is this is the code which basically does the same thing in haskell so what what's what's different What's the kind of, uh, apart from syntax, right? So apart from the fact that this, this one is much more compact um, and instead of looping, I, I kind of do the map. Uh, what else is uh, slightly different between this and this and, and this? Exactly we don't introduce this extra things that we don't care about. Like, I don't care about X. I, I don't even need to think about X. Why do I need to think about X? I don't, uh, I, you know, I, I'm just have the collection and I have to do something with it. And I don't care about X. And in both of those implementations, I do need to introduce it and I do need to 
kind of care about it and do stuff with it. And that's completely unnecessary. So, you know, by design, those loops introduce this extra, um, you know, extra baggage to something that is completely unrelated, right? Uh, like I totally should not be doing this. I, I don't care about X. So uh, as Frederick is suggesting, uh, let's, okay, I can actually do this here. So I can show you the final implementation, um, which is this one. Yeah, actually I have it in this window, so I can show you here, right? So in this implementation, I did two changes. So one change, sorry. Uh, oh, come on. I am, yeah, now we see everything. So we had those two alternatives and they were kind of not perfect. And then I have the final alternative and I like the final alternative the most. Um, so the initial thing kind of feels much more like Pascal. <laughs> like, you know, you, you initializing something and you don't care how it is done, right? Like you don't need to know that behind the scene, something like this happens, right? You, it's, it's, it, you know, if you compare this, uh, if you compare this to this, first of all, yeah, this one is much more compact. Second of all, this one is kind of in a single place. Like I am, I, I'm not gonna miss a world, a word because I kind of forgot a line. I kind of see it immediately here. And also I kind of don't care how the compiler will do this. Like here, I'm telling the compiler, do this, do this, do this. Here, I'm saying, you, you know, just give me the, the vector with those values. And, uh, you know, how it happens, it's sort of, I don't care, right? Here, I sort of say, ah, I care how it happens. So this one is more imperative, right? This one is more declarative, right? And then the second thing is, I don't need to take account for the index. I don't care about the index. I just want to do this on this V, on this collection. Uh, and I kind of don't really care uh, about the, you know, what, what, whatever the type was because I was sort of doing this anyway. So I don't need to know uh, kind of the details of what V is so I can use auto. Um, so this code, even though it's longer, it kind of feels now much more similar to the way I would think about this problem, which is this map print and the, you know, the, yeah, hello, beautiful word, right? Um, so this, how I think about the problem, this is how I have to code it. And the coding is kind of equivalent, right? It's, you know, yes, this, this one is a little bit more compact, but there is no big difference now conceptually between this and this. Whereas with the first two, there is. Uh, those are much more imperative and they are kind of very tedious. I have to do a lot of accounting and I can introduce a lot of problems if I do this, you know, not carefully how I align the conditions and so on, right? Uh, so here I can do a lot of much more mistakes Whereas this one is not only more compact, but it's also safer. And I kind of don't care about the details. So when we kind of discussing this, we need to have um, a language which uh, allows us to compare and say, yeah, this one feels more declarative and this one feels more imperative and we need to have those words, right? So we will talk a little bit about them now, but before we do, uh, let me show you something. So I got access to this um, uh, GitHub Copilot, which is sort of an AI, which tries to uh, help, um, tries to help you uh, coding the, the problems. So if I start typing, it will kind of uh, suggest what it thinks I want to, to add, right? So if I say, it kind of suggests hello world, which is not what I want, but if I say, the beautiful word, right? 
uh, and finish this. Then if I go to my second alternative and try to, to do it like I didn't type anything, but it kind of recognized that I'm doing this pattern and I'm introducing, I'm, I'm saying hello, the beautiful word. And it kind of suggests that automatically. So sometimes it has a very good uh, code analysis and it sort of, uh, so, you know, uh, makes it easy for, um, uh, didn't suggest it here. Uh, didn't recognize that I want the there here as well. But for some for some situations, it does quite a good job. So if you have access to the um, to the copilot, uh, you could have solved a lot of problems um, automatically because I've tested it for the Haskell assignment one. And as long as you type what you want, uh, most of the time it actually does the the things quite nice for you, especially with the folds and some of the Haskell collections. It's kind of really smart. So it's kind of amazing how uh, how well it, it uh, solves some of the uh, coding tasks that were in the assignment, but without coding, you can kind of have it done. Um, yeah, so the, the coding um, is hugely improved by, uh, by this kind of AI engine. All right, anyway, uh, let's move on. So programming paradigms you know of. So I mentioned two uh, just, just before, um, but what programming paradigms do you know? Imperative, functional, yep. What else? Object-oriented, good. Data oriented. So there are some major ones, uh, which I'm sure you know, um, and there are some more um, more niche paradigms which um, are not mainstream, but we do have exposure to them as well. Um, so all right, so at the end of this class, I'm sure you will be able to type more uh, paradigms uh, than those four. Uh, so before we continue, we have to agree on some prerequisites. So a paradigm is a way of doing something. So you know, um, it's a kind of a, a structure on top of some concepts, so like some way of thinking or way of doing. Uh, sometimes some of the simple ways of doing things are called patterns. Uh, but if you have a number of patterns, then as a group, then you kind of have a paradigm. So paradigm is sort of a, something bigger than a pattern, but it, it kind of encapsulates a certain uh, way of thinking about something or a way of doing something, right? Um, a language is a tool, is a way, kind of, it's a mechanism for you to express. Uh, so paradigm is always abstract. It doesn't have kind of a concrete um, instantiation. Uh, languages are concrete. So paradigms and languages are kind of separate, right? So paradigms is a way of thinking and language is a tool like, you know, like a hammer to actually do something. Uh, so that's kind of important distinction because in common language, we make a mistake of, uh, for example, saying programming language paradigms. There are no programming language paradigms because you can only have programming paradigms uh, and then languages are concrete things about programming paradigms, right? So there are no programming language paradigms. There are programming paradigms. And then paradigms are not exclusive. So they are not kind of uh, non-overlapping. Paradigms, you know, by the definition, they are sort of abstract and often overlapping. Uh, so, you know, paradigm is a way of grouping things, but the groups are not kind of completely isolated. They are overlapping. Um, and languages are kind of a concrete tools for you to be able to express certain paradigms. So don't use the phrase programming language paradigms, just you know, 
correct people say, no, there are no programming language paradigms. There are only programming paradigms. All right, so I'm kind of start to rent, rent a little bit. So the first one is imperative, all right? Um, so imperative is characterized by explicit sequence of commands. Uh, and then the, each command updates the state of the computation and you're directly manipulating, um, you are directly manipulating the, you know, the state, right? So here is the example of imperative programming. Each instruction, you know, manipulates the state, same here. Um, so those kind of are good examples of imperative programming uh, because each instruction modifies the state and we explicitly saying what is happening in, um, in our sort of abstract computational model. Um, so we directly manipulating computational resources. And you are very familiar with that. You started with this paradigm and uh, you are kind of very familiar with this, with this paradigm. Um, a second paradigm that we often use is structured. So it is a form of imperative programming uh, with clean nested control structures. Uh, and we avoid go-to statements. So in most structured programming um, uh, paradigms, you don't have a uh, go-to statement at all. Or if you do have it, it's kind of considered not non-idiomatic. It's sort of like a you know exceptional case that you should not ever need to use. Uh, so structured programming is uh, again. Let's bring it back. So here we have a function uh, which encapsulates some sort of a, a state, uh, uh, some state changes. Here we also have this sort of a for loops. Uh, where we have um, um, kind of encapsulation of what X is and X doesn't exist outside of this scope, right? So we have kind of um, ability to group things and to nest things and don't spill over the state be, you know, uh, beyond that particular nesting. So structured programming is you know, most of the imperative programming languages that you know uh, that have imperative support, I mean, um, you, they, they are sort of uh, following the, the structured uh, paradigm. So um, an assembly is an imperative programming language which doesn't have, kind of, it's not structured. They were kind of a macro assembly uh, extensions which were allowing you to group things, but they were still very limited and they were not considered structured and um, Pascal or, or you know, uh, C, they are kind of structured. Um, uh, they are programming languages which are following the kind of a structured programming paradigm. Um, so I've learned uh, programming using uh, assembly. Uh, the, the first programming language I've, I've used was assembly and then basic. So I actually learned programming using imperative programming languages, um, uh, languages which are you know, uh, following the imperative paradigm. Um, and then it was actually quite hard for me to, to understand structured programming, to con conceptualize it and um, like to understand for loops and to understand, you know, functions, uh, which is bizarre, right? You would think, yeah, come on, that's just basics. But it, it kind of highlights how the paradigm influences your way of thinking about the problem. Like if you really, like I was really immersed in imperative uh, way of thinking about problems and then to move to structured, that was a lot of effort. It really took me almost a week to understand for loops, right? Uh, I, I, it was just not easy to click. I, I was sort of uh, thinking in the, in the kind of a go-to and jump uh, model and then understanding the scoping rules and the, the kind of the em embedding of the of the brackets and all that it was yeah, not not that trivial. It, of course, it is trivial, but it, it's sort of um, we take for granted what we understand and how we conceptualize something that things can be conceptualized completely differently. Um, so don't underestimate that. All right, and then we have procedural, right? Uh, so again, it's sort of a form of imperative structure programming, but based on procedures. 
And then instead of functions, which always return some stuff, we have you know, procedures which group operations, but don't return anything, right? And in Pascal, you had both. You had procedures and you had functions. Uh, and in most um, programming languages, you can have both. Uh, and if, if, the, like, if the function doesn't return anything, you can kind of say it is a procedure, right? Uh, historically speaking, that's how we distinguished functions from, from procedures. We don't do this distinction anymore. We just say the function returns void, right? The, the function doesn't return anything. But historically, we call those specifically, we call them procedures. <laughs> And Pascal was the, the first programming language that I've learned, which was procedural and structured, which wasn't imperative, purely imperative. And that kind of uh, made me, um, <laughs> you know, it, it made a, a lot of trouble. All right, so then we have declarative. Um, so in declarative uh, paradigm, we don't have a direct sequence of instructions. We have declarations. Right. So again, if we go to the C code uh, here, we don't say specifically how things should happen or, you know, how the runtime system should do it. We just declare that there is V and V is initialized to those values. Right. Uh, so this is much more declarative compared to this, which is much more imperative. Right. Um, this we specifically say how the state is being changed line by line. Here we, we don't have any state change. We have a declaration of what V is, and it kind of follows more of a declarative paradigm, right? So declarative paradigm is there are no direct sequences of instructions. We specifying what rather than how. And we specify the result, what we want to achieve rather than how to get there, right? Um, same with this uh, iterator and for loop with the, um, with the range. Um, it, it is more we say, well, we want this to iterate over that collection. How it actually happens? Well, I don't care. Like the compiler will compile some code with this index and whatever it needs to be done, but we kind of don't care how it will happen, right? Um, so again, this kind of a for loop, even though it, it is imperative uh, in, in a sense, because we are sort of um, not declaring the, the total outcome, it's much more declarative compared to the uh, imperative pr uh, pr prior uh, attempts, right? All right, so um, what else do we have? So we covered Imperative, structured, procedural, and declarative. So we have four. What else we had? We had object-oriented, right? So maybe the next one is, no, we have functional. So functional um, paradigm is based on functions. Uh, we are basing the, we get more complex things by doing function composition. And we avoid having global state because we enclose, encapsulate the logic inside functions. And we pass functions around and we scope things such that our variables are inside functions. And if we need to pass a state, it is passed by the results and by input to functions, right? Um, so this now, by now you are much more familiar with um, because you've been exposed to Haskell. So Haskell is a, a, is a language which is following the functional paradigm and it exposes kind of the tools for you to be solving problems using the functional uh, paradigm. So when we, we compare the solution to, the, to this problem, uh, we, again, like uh, language, uh, come on, Pascal, and then we have map, what was that, print, um, Hello, yeah, great. No, 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 hello, this one, yeah. So what do I have is I have my collection, I have my collection here, and then I have two functions, right? Here, I have a lot of boilerplate, right? I have to do a lot of, you know, fiddling with syntax and a lot of boilerplate to say what actually happens and how to achieve the same behavior because 
it's not purely declarative. It's sort of, um, it has an imperative feel, right? So this code is much more imperative compared to this. And this one is much more functional compared to this. Uh, so Haskell gives us more facilities to operate on. Um, uh, yeah, so I would, I would need the final line, right? It's not exactly the same because I'm missing this one. So I would add, I would need to add this final print printout of the end of line character, um, and also this one is cheating a little bit because this one is uh, uh, adding the it's not adding the space between. So I would need to intersperse the the you know this. So it's not exactly equivalent. So yeah. Anyway, uh, that's just minor minor things. So we have functional and you kind of by now know the functional and then object oriented. You also know because you've been exposed to um, object oriented programming from uh, C++ uh, and you know about the kind of the object encapsulation and what object oriented uh, paradigm is. But uh, I will challenge you that your way of thinking about object oriented programming is wrong. Uh, you don't, fully appreciate how object-oriented prog uh, programming paradigm works in your head if you've been exposed only to C++. Um, because for many purists, for many people who do object-oriented uh, programming, um, the C++ is actually a very poor object-oriented language in, in support of the object-oriented paradigm. Um, so what are the... Um, core properties of object-oriented prototype uh, uh, paradigm that it's based on objects. You see, so, so here you already have a bit of a mismatch because C++ is kind of based on classes, right? It's kind of C with classes. It's not C with objects. Um, so you already have a kind of a, a bit of a cognitive dissonance saying, well, is C++ really object-oriented? Um, it, it is, but not really. Uh, why? Um, so first of all, you have to have a facility to be based on objects. Everything in the language, the fundamental element of the language is an object. And then you have an ability to send messages to one another, right? So objects can send messages to one another. What does it mean? Well, conceptually, if you think about it, like if you have, um, so if I have, um, you know, I have a student object, I have S, uh, and S kind of is a student, right? So let's say I have a student type and S is a student, then I can send messages to S, right? So I can say S dot, and then calling a function is like sending a message, right? So I can say, you know, do this, do something, right? Do something, and then I can have parameters. And that's fine, that's, you know, C++ does that, right? But in C++, you cannot call a method, for example, which doesn't exist. Uh, this is not part of student. I cannot call this method if if, if I haven't declared that the S can uh, have this this method, right? So that means it's already broken because by design I should be able to send messages to one another, and if I cannot send a message. That means it's it's kind of not working. Why would I be ever sending a message which is not implemented to a, to an object? Well, you know, because of um, generic types and because I may not know what type of S is, I may be kind of trying to send a message that is not implemented yet, but will be implemented later. Or maybe I have a default handler, which does something to messages that are sort of unknown. Uh, so it, it is very loosely coupled system. So if I have objects and they can send messages to one another and it's very loosely coupled, of course you can have a situation where one object is sending a message to another object and this say, well, sorry, I don't understand your message, right? You could have this situation at runtime. And some languages like Objective-C uh, allow you to do that, right? So Objective-C, uh, you know, small talk, small talk, uh, squeak, 
those languages are object oriented and they allow you to do that. They are based on objects and they are based on uh, objects sending messages to one another. I think self also allows you to do that. Um, self is kind of a, also very interesting object oriented uh, language because it is based, um, it's uh, based on prototypes, prototypes. It, it is similar uh, to JavaScript a little bit. Uh, because in JavaScript, you also can create an instance of an object without having a class. You can just say, oh yeah, I have this with those fields and those methods and suddenly you have an object and you never really declared what kind of type it is or what class it is, right? Uh, so you have um, object oriented way of thinking or kind of a paradigm which is class based or prototype based and most kind of a pure object oriented languages, they are prototype based, not class based. So again, there is kind of a mismatch. So, you know, um, commonly we think C++ is a great example of object oriented programming language, but in reality, it's a very poor uh, example because it doesn't have a lot of facilities which are uh, kind of aligned with object oriented paradigm. So it is kind of C with classes, but it's not, properly object-oriented. Um, another ability of object-oriented languages that uh, C++ doesn't have is that I, if I have um, if I have S, and S is a void, um, void star, right? So I, I don't know what it is. It's an uh, opaque uh, pointer. So it's a reference to an opaque pointer. I cannot ask uh, I cannot ask S, um, what are you um, at runtime? I cannot say, okay, what type are you? Like, what can I do with you? What messages do you understand? Like, how can I interact with you? Uh, I, I cannot do that with, with those other languages that I showed you, like Objective-C um, and uh, Smalltalk and so on, uh, they, you, of course you can do that. You can even do that with Java, right? So Java is more OO than C++ is uh, because Java has more, uh, it's, it's based more on um, this kind of fundamental aspects of object orientation uh, and object oriented paradigm. Uh, a very good, very nice object oriented language is Ruby. Um, so uh, Ruby is an example of, uh, of an object-oriented language, very similar to Objective-C and, and uh, Smalltalk, where everything is an object and you have ability to send messages to, uh, to all the objects and they can deal with this kind of very loosely coupled system. Uh, C++ is more, you know, you have this concept of classes and, and instances, but it's only kind of at com compile time that, that it's useful. At runtime, you, you don't have any of those facilities at, at all. Um, also another uh, property that object-oriented languages have is called reification. And reification is a mechanism to morph or, or to change shape, right? So for example, if I have S, and S is a student uh, and student has certain capabilities like, you know, you can have a student ID and name and whatever you do as a student, but then I have an ability to reify. So let's say uh, Marius is an instance, instance or object of student, right? I can say I can morph Marius to something else. So I can say Marius now, uh, I can reify it and I can change it to be a student assistant. So it's a student, but it also is helping a teacher with some courses and it has additional abilities. So in JavaScript, you can do that. If you have an instance, you can kind of add new fields or new properties or new functions to the existing prototype or existing object. And in um, all those other programming languages like th these ones, you can also do that. Um, in Java, you can, you cannot really do that, but you can add it via reflection. So Java has a reflection and you can add additional behaviors through kind of a reflective mechanism. You have to build a little bit of infrastructure to that. So it does, it's not natively supported, but in those languages, it, it is, um, you know, uh, natively supported and in the, in, in, uh, in the context of self also. 
um, you can kind of uh, change shape. And in C++, you cannot do that, right? So C++ doesn't have a lot of features that kind of come for free if you are thinking about the problem in an object-oriented way. And C++ doesn't have any of those. Um, so C++ is a very kind of, um, you know, um, handicapped example of a language which tries to do object-oriented programming. Okay, so let's move to the next one and then we'll have a break. So the final one which we have here is logic rule-based uh, and there are various examples of those. Uh, we didn't use any uh, yet, uh, but if you ever need to do some AI or do some kind of um, uh, game programming, you may want to do forward chaining of some plans, like your agents may need to plan something and then execute them. So you would kind of use a forward chaining engine or backward chaining engine. Uh, Prolog is an example of a backwards uh, chaining engine given a certain set of axioms. It can kind of uh, work out what needs to happen to for those axioms to be satisfied. Uh, and it has basically an inference engine built in. So logic rule-based uh, paradigms, they have a certain inference engine built in and you take advantage of that built-in machinery such that you don't have to do it yourself manually, but it's, it's part of the runtime system. It's part of the, you know, the machinery that is exposed to you. Uh, so some of the logic puzzle solvers or some theorem provers or some of the uh, compilers or like optimizers or some of the uh, planners, they are all based on some sort of a, uh, like it's, it's very nice to use some sort of a logic paradigm to, to use for solving those problems, right? I, we had, uh, when I was a student, we had uh, exposure to this uh, paradigm as well. We had to take a course in logic programming uh, and it was sort of a mixture of a little bit of math and kind of logic programming. Um, I don't really use it on in everyday life, but I know some people are, you know, building some complex uh, expert systems or some AI um, systems using this type of uh, machinery. All right, so let's have a break. Um, let's have a break. Uh, yeah, let's let's do this. And in the break, you will try to solve this puzzle. Um, and the the solving of this puzzle is you know, each letter represents a digit and you have an S and M are not zero. So the, the, those two numbers are like uh, four digits long and each letter is a unique digit, right? So let's say M is one. So M is one here and here. And then you need to solve this puzzle, right? You need to find what sort of mapping between digits and letters solves this, uh, this puzzle. So let's have... Uh, Timer, 10 minutes. Okay, great. So we will meet in 9.35. Send more money. Okay, anyone? If anyone can solve this in uh, 10 minutes using the programming languages you know, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna get a bonus point for sure. No cheating, don't Google it. All right, so see you in uh, nine minutes.
Excellent. So anyone solved the send more money puzzle? <laughs> yeah, it's not that trivial actually. But how would you solve it? Any ideas? Where is my terminal? Okay, so the, the idea here is that we do need to map the letters to digits. So we have to have eight because there are eight uh, unique letters here, right? So it's uh, S, E, N, D. So four, five, six, seven, and then they repeat. And then we have Y, which is eight. So we have eight unique um, letters and each letter needs to be uh, unique and it can be from zero to nine, right? So we have to say uh, all of them can be from zero to, to nine, but S and M have, have to be uh, non-zero, so more than zero. So we have some constraints and then we have to say if we uh, have because the, the, the S is on the thousandth position and then E here is on the hundredth position, tens and uh, units, right? And this E is kind of on the um, tens. So we have to have kind of a mechanism given the digits to kind of generate the number. And then if we add those two numbers, we have to get this final number. So we have to have a little bit of a facilities to, to code. So one facility is we would need to uh, express a, an ability to convert four digits into a number. Uh, and then we need to represent those four digits. Uh, so, you know, the, the most natural way of representing the, the puzzle is probably to use lists. So to have kind of a list of, um, of digits to be able to be convertible to a number and then express those constraints related to the that S and M are not zero. And then each number, each uh, letter is uh, unique and, and so on. So it will take like, if you do it in Golang, for example, or C++, it will take a, a bit of a, uh, a little bit of code to achieve this. Uh, and then if you have problems like this to solve, uh, as we were kind of this, as I was discussing about it, um, we have some constraints and we have some sort of behavior, right? So the behavior is that the sum of those two numbers equals to this number. And then we have uh, some constraints about the structure of the, of, the, of the letters, right? So there is a solution um, to this problem. Um, let's say you don't know this programming language because you don't know it, right? Uh, but can you understand what is happening here? Um, so we have some sort of a process, procedure, uh, and we can see that we have some sort of domain declared er along those uh, eight letters, right? So we have those eight letters declared here, uh, that, and then we have some sort of solution, which is the, those eight eight letters. And we are saying that the, the domain of those letters is between zero and nine, right? So we have kind of the first two lines express to us what the, the, um, the domain of the representation of the data is. And then we have some sort of a instruction saying that, uh, that all those letters are distinct. 
So the, they, do, they don't equal, pairwise, they don't equal to each other, right? So we have this constraint saying that across our domain, the, all the, 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 the digits or the letters are distinct. So this is the, the line number three. And then we have that S is not zero and M is not zero, right? So even though we don't know this language, like you don't know this language, it, it is sort of possible to read it. And then we have another constraint which says, thousand times S, hundred plus uh, times E, 10 times N plus D, plus the money, the more equals money, right? So we have this, the actual coding of the problem that we had uh, originally in the, um, in, in this, right? So we coded this, this equation by, you know, uh, expressing it as the, yeah, as we would in kind of the, the um, va uh, variable multiplication and we have the cent more money, right? That has to hold, right? So there is another constraint saying that that has to hold. Uh, and then the final thing, we don't understand that one, right? So it was kind of easy to follow up to here. And then this one, you would need to know that FF is fail first. And then the distribute is kind of the search which you know goes on and tries to map uh, a solution to this uh, to this domain using kind of a distributed algorithm with fail, fail first um, um, heuristic, uh, and that's it. That that is basically a solution to this puzzle using the Mozart uh, OS programming language, uh, which you can have a look in uh, following that link, and that link has all the explanation of how how it works, right? So Mozart is a multi-paradigm programming language. Uh, so it is kind of suited for multiple programming paradigms. Um, and it has a constraint uh, paradigm built in such that you can um, use constraint programming to solve puzzles like that. Um, and the, you know, the biggest benefit, of course, is this line, <laughs> this kind of engine, which does the search for you but the actual logic is expressed as a set of constraints. So all of those are constraints which constrain what the solution can be. And then this line basically does the search to find what would be the mapping between the domain from zero to nine to those letters such that all those constraints are fulfilled, right? Uh, this is much more declarative that you know, to solving this problem using, you know, Rust or um, or Golang or C++, because we're declaring the constraints and then we're saying, then let's go and solve it, like you solve it, right? I told you all the constraints, now you solve it. And I'm, I'm not telling the runtime system how to solve it. Like the engine is already there and it kind of does all the, uh, you know, the search uh, the tree search and kind of uh, trim it based on the constraint that I gave, right? So you may think, can I do the same with uh, C++ or Golang? Sure, you could. You, you have to define those constraints because no matter what you do, you have to define the constraints. But then the search, you would have to implement yourself, right? You would have to implement this sort of a uh, search uh, across all the possible solutions checking every time if the particular solutions uh, fail some of the constraints, right? Um, is there anybody commenting on things or questioning? No. All right, so now we can ask, can we solve this in Haskell? How would that would look in, in Haskell? Um, and Haskell, because Haskell is partially declarative, partially, you know, uh, imperative. Like most of the time we can declare things uh, and some of the time we can't. So this is the one of the possible solutions in Haskell. Um, it's quite unique um, in a sense that it's very similar to the previous one in, in, in Mozart. <laughs> uh, and what I really like about the cleverness of this solution is that you can, you, you have this uh, representation of the digits as a list of integers and it calculates the final integer and it does it kind of cleverly using a fault. 
Um, so it kind of goes uh, digit by digit and multiplies it by 10 each iteration, such that at the end you get the, like if I have um, send, let's say it's 1069, then I would get kind of the, uh, the computation kind of doing the 1069 by doing this fault. Uh, if, I, if I put the, the digits in, in a list. So this is already quite clever uh, because it, it's using fault to do this conversion. Uh, and it's quite you know, easy to follow. Uh, and then the actual evaluator is using the state T um, um, construct. And as you see, like even if you don't follow all the details, you see that we are declaring all the letters as a sort of a, a state T um, expansion. And then we have some guards. So we say S is not zero and M is not zero. And then we say send, yeah, we convert this send to a number, more to a number and money to a number. And then we have another guard saying send plus more has to equal to money. So we have two guards, I, you know, three because we say end. So it's this guard with S not zero and M not zero with this send more money here. And then we have this magic, which kind of happens in the middle, which is this, um, it takes advantage of the state E. I encourage you to read the, the explanation in the, uh, in the blog post here to sort of um, get appreciation. How can you use state T to solve things like that? Noticeably, it is quite inefficient, right? So for complex puzzles, the search of this implementation is quite inefficient because of the way Haskell kind of does the, the pattern matching and how this kind of expands the, the search tree, right? So the previous one, this, this search is extremely efficient and it solves even very complex puzzles in a kind of um, very uh, efficient way. Whereas the Haskell one is not as clever and it, it, it does the search in a very naive way. So it's a little bit um, uh, inefficient in, in the search part, uh, but in the declarativeness part, it's as clever as the previous one, right? So in some languages, you can take advantage of the paradigm that the language was not designed for, but it still kind of is able to, to help you with this, right? So. I hope I kind of interested you a little bit with the with the Mozart. Um, Mozart is a multi paradigm programming language which has a functional uh, constraint programming and some other and, and even uh, a little bit of logic paradigm built in. So you can do you can play with with Mozart and have a little bit of a feel of those other paradigms. Um, but it is kind of an old fashioned and it's very academic. So. Uh, one of our students, um, uh, Per Morton, actually, he was taking a course in uh, multi-paradigm programming languages in um, NTNU Trondheim, and they had a course, and they are using uh, Mozart as a sort of the, the language of choice. Um, but uh, it is harder to use it compared to Haskell, for example, because the tool chain and all the support and all the you know IDE support and all that is kind of missing. So it's a little bit of a hard going if you want to play with Mozart and kind of uh, experience the uh, experience it as an example of uh, various paradigms that you want to expose yourself to. But the constraint programming, I really like personally. I, I haven't used it a lot. I used it a little bit for some of the AI courses in um, the previous university. Um, and it allows you to kind of succinctly express some of the rules such that you can solve some of the uh, constraint uh, problems. Like if you have some constraints and you want to find what sort of solutions could um, comply with those constraints. All right, so constraint-based paradigm. Um, you have a form of declarative, it, it is a form of declarative programming. Uh, you have a set of constraints typically over finite domains. Uh, there are some attempts to do that over infinite domains, but usually it's very 
uh, difficult to do an efficient search, like if, if your domains are infinite, uh, because you kind of need to brute force like the iterations, unless you have some um, heuristics that you can kind of employ. But if you have heuristics, usually you don't use constraint-based programming, you use some sort of soft computing, like you use, um, you know, um, various uh, artificial annealing or va various uh, machine learning methods to solve those kind of uh, infinite domain problems. Um, and then you have the inference engine built in. And one of the example of uh, programming um, systems and programming languages, Mozart is the language and Mozart OS is the kind of the entire um, runtime system. Uh, you, can, you can play with it. Okay, so then you have other ones, um, event-driven. So when you are programming in the event-driven paradigm, you have emitters and listeners, and you have kind of a generators and sinks, and you're organizing things into flows. You have kind of a flows of events being driven from the sources to sinks or from emitters to listeners. And then you kind of programming your system using this kind of asynchronous mechanisms um, to achieve something based on the user inputs or based on the network uh, information coming from a network or something like that, right? So event-driven paradigm is very well suited for GUIs or for systems where you don't um, program behavior kind of, uh, you, you program reactive behavior on top of some sort of triggers. Uh, and we do have, uh, we do have uh, programming languages which support this paradigm natively, but most, most often we use uh, libraries which expose certain APIs and certain uh, programming constructs to allow you to program in kind of the event-driven paradigm. Uh, Java has, you know, yeah, event uh, emitters and event listeners, and in Java you can do some of it. Uh, you can have libraries for C++ or, or Golang which kind of do that. Golang has channels so you can do this, um, you can experience that a little bit with, with, with um, language support of those languages, but the paradigm itself is a little bit separate. And there is a kind of a separate genre of programmers which are used especially for entertainment, which are using this type of um, event-driven programming. And there are certain languages which are tailored specifically for that, for that paradigm. Um, and then we have a concurrent uh, programming paradigm uh, where you are splitting your logic into multiple tasks and you are allowing multiple things to happen concurrently. It's similar to the previous one, right? Uh, we often combine concurrent paradigm with the event-driven paradigm. Uh, and then you have um, um, computations which are not ordered as a single kind of a sequence. In, in the event driven, you have kind of sequences of triggers and sinks and triggers and sinks. Uh, and here you can have a little bit more complex uh, dependencies and more complex interactions. And then there are other. Um, aspect oriented um, is a paradigm where you can uh, program kind of a cross cutting concerns. So for example, if you have your business logic and you're doing something in your program uh, and the program is finished and you, you sort of coded everything and it, it works, what, whatever style it is. Let's say it, it was in, in imperative style, you are doing some form of game um, and you have some methods and they do certain things. And then you say, I would like to inject kind of logging into my um, program without disrupting the original uh, structure, but I want to kind of inject a cross-cutting concern where I kind of introduce logging into certain functions, certain methods that, that I have without touching the original code. In normal programming languages, that's kind of hard. You have to go back to your original code and recompile it with this extra logging that you add to your methods. Um, but if you have an aspect-oriented programming, you are allowed to sort of intersperse or in inject some of the logic into your existing kind of structure without touching the existing structure. Uh, so you, for example, can add logging or you can add billing or you can add some decorations, like some additional things to whatever is already happening and then arrange them in some sort of a dynamic way, right? So. They have been um, 
they have been quite hype uh, about aspect-oriented programming maybe uh, 20, 15 years ago. Uh, there has been a, a really nice library added to Java, which was allowing you to achieve this type of behavior. Um, but it, it is kind of hard and it, it, you pay the price, of course. So if you want to have this sort of paradigm implemented as a, as a, as a uh, facilities for that paradigm in a programming la language and in the runtime, you have to pay certain performance penalty for the flexibility that it offers. And because of that, um, and because of the no real big killer kind of use cases like logging and billing are kind of typical use cases, but you know, if you know you have to have billing or logging in your system, you can kind of design it with billing or logging already, and it's not something you're dynamically adding and removing from, from your code base. Uh, but aspect-oriented is an interesting concept, and this kind of a cross-cutting concerns are quite useful metaphor when we are discussing sometimes the, uh, the problems at hand. And then we have data-oriented or stream-based and so on. The list continues and it's not fixed like we it's an evolving field we are coming up with new ideas and the new concepts and we sort of making it um more robust for people to use it right so languages are tools uh, they support specific paradigms but there are no single language for a single paradigm they are always multi-paradigm for worse or, or better right uh, some languages are more pure than others. So for example, Haskell is more purely functional programming, uh, supports pro uh, functional programming paradigm compared to C++, for example, even though you can program in C++ using functional paradigm, it's not restricted, right? So a language is just a tool and you can program any of those paradigms in any of the languages it's just that in some languages, it's easier than in others, right? And uh, some are more multi-paradigm by, by design than others, which means they have a good facilities and they are easy to use across multiple paradigms compared to some other languages. So for example, in um, Golang, it's quite nice to use it as a structured imperative programming and as a functional programming, but it's not very easy to use it as a declarative, right, paradigm, uh, because uh, it has limited uh, declarativeness, expressiveness. Uh, and some languages are accidentally multi-paradigm, like, you know, C++, you can program functionally or declaratively in C++, but it's either a lot of pain or it's uh, unusable, right? Um, it's it is possible, but it's not really that useful. Um, all right, so we have a couple of questions for you. Um, so programming language supports one or multiple programming paradigms to allow programmers to use the most suitable programming style and associated language constructs for a given task. Yeah, let's assume that's a good definition. Um, so C. What um, programming paradigms you think C is the most suitable for? Most of them are multi-paradigm. You can program in them in different paradigms, but what is C the most representative of? What paradigm can it be used with uh, the, the, the easiest? Yeah, object oriented, but not that great, right? It's it is possible, but it's limited to what it can do. Imperative, perfect. It's a perfect example of imperative. Uh, structured also. Procedural also. Object oriented, not so, not so, not so much. Haskell. Yep, functional and declarative. And with the do notation and with some of the monadic uh, constructs, it is not too bad to use it as an imperative, um, using imperative style as well. Um, 
it's not the best. Yes, it's not as good as Golang or C in imperative, but you can kind of do some imperative programming with, with it as well. But declarative and functional are probably uh, spot on. Go. Go is similar to C. So it is, you know, imperative structured uh, procedural, uh, but it has kind of a functional feel. You can use uh, higher order functions easily. You can pass functions around easily. Um, it has kind of a good facilities to do some of the functional programming. Um, yeah, very nice, concurrent and event driven. That's that's kind of good. Uh, it is, yeah, it is object oriented and it's a little bit more object oriented than C because of the implementation of the methods on top of structs. So I would say it, it has sort of a, a little bit more facility. Excellent. So what's next? Rust. That one is a little bit harder. Imperative, yeah, definitely. Declarative, to some extent, they are trying to make it uh, a little bit more declarative, such that, for example, you can operate on infinite um, collections, right? So languages which allow you to have infinite collections are much more declarative than the ones that they cannot. So in C++, can you have infinite collections? Not really. Like in C, not really. Uh, you can have, you, of course you have vectors, so you can keep adding things, but you cannot declare an infinite like uh, array or infinite uh, collection, right? Um, so Rust has some declarativeness, imperative, structured, procedural, yeah. Uh, Logic-based, no, no rule-based, no, uh, no sort of fancy runtime system support. Um, functional. Yes, to some extent, it has kind of a functional flavor, especially around collections. Uh, you can use it in kind of a functional style. So yeah, some, some multi-paradigm flavors there. So now it's about you. You have to ask yourself, uh, what style suits me best? Like how, what I am efficient in and how do I solve problems? Uh, do I solve problems easiest in imperative style or declarative style or both. Uh, and then you have to sort of ask yourself uh, why, right? So I'm going a little bit over time. So I will um, speed up. So if you could uh, answer quickly. <laughs> uh, last year, most people said imperative as well. Uh, some said both. There is a research suggesting that if you were initially exposed to imperative programming style, you will be biased towards imperative way of thinking. And if you were exposed initially as into the declarative programming style, you will be biased towards declarative or both. Uh, the, the imperative will come easy to you. So people, uh, the researchers suggested that we should start teaching people programming by declarative style, because then it kind of reduces the bias. Um, I am an example where I was exposed to imperative and I made an effort to kind of uh, unbias myself and be equally you know, good. And I appreciate declarative style more. Uh, I like declarative style more now, even though I came from imperative background. Um, but it, it, as we were talking earlier, you have to be aware of your own biases and try to work with them to take advantage of that and also to uh, strengthen where you feel you are a little bit weaker, right? So again, which style suits you best, object-oriented or functional? I spent a uh, majority of my time using object-oriented and I'm very well familiar with the object-oriented methodologies and with the languages which are fully object-oriented. Uh, but I have to admit, I, I prefer functional. It's, um, it's more robust and more safe and you get less into trouble uh, compared to object oriented. So, and, and we see the tendency now on the market, almost, more, almost all languages, they are kind of reducing the, the facilities of object oriented 
um, support, uh, and they are kind of boosting more and more facilities for functional uh, style. So if you're kind of in the middle, that's great, of course. Uh, you, should, you should be good at both. And now, you know, if you were a choice, uh, if you had a choice, what would you choose? Imperative structured, object-oriented, functional, or declarative? Or it depends. Yes, the correct answer is here. Very good. It depends on the problem. And some problems, you know, as we've seen, uh, constraint-based programming is the best choice. You just declare the constraints and, you know, that's the, the coding you need to do. Um, so it kind of highly depends on the problem of what you need to do. Uh, and the more you know, the more uh, problems you've solved and the more exposure you had to different paradigms, the more you are kind of on that camp. Like you're neutral, you don't have a bias, uh, and you're sort of choosing kind of the, the tool for the job. Uh, but initially, of course, when you are very skilled in one particular paradigm or one particular programming language, then you tend to pick that because it feels the easiest. But the reality is it's often wrong, uh, heuristic, um, because you're sort of using hammer for everything, right? You cannot use hammer for everything. You have sometimes to use a screwdriver. So, all right. So that's it. Uh, that's it for today. Again, I went a little bit over time. So uh, if you picked why, then kind of consider what are the strengths and weaknesses of various paradigms and why would you use this against this problem or vice versa, right? And how would you solve the send uh, more money uh, problem using uh, structured programming like in C++ or Go? How would you approach it? How would you sort of code all the constraints and how you code the search? Uh, could you take advantage of some implemented search methods in collections, like maybe depth first or breadth first on trees, and then try to code your solution as a sort of a tree and tree search. Uh, how would you do this? If we're using facility like uh, Haskell or um, uh, Mozart, where they have built-in search, then uh, you can check how they're doing it. Do they do by depth first or breadth first or fail, fail fast? Um, so you can sort of uh, inspect a little bit. Okay, so that's it. I will post the slides on the um, on the wiki, and I will record a short um, short discussion, like a short uh, talk about the exam and the submission of the portfolio. So uh, maybe we can have like a Q and A session uh, after the video such that uh, I clarify what you can expect for the exam, but it's a little bit uh, in the future. So um, once I kind of uh, agree with the examination office, I will let you know, and then I will post, as I uh, uh, um, previously said, I will post the kind of a questions that will you will have to fill in for the portfolio submission earlier on the wiki, such that you will have a bit of time to prepare. And then I will talk a little bit about the exam. It will be very similar to last year. And there, are, there is a video, I think there is a video about the last year exam. So you can, you can have a look in the channel. Um, okay, so without extending it further, thank you very much. And thanks for this semester. That, that is our last lecture. Uh, but feel free to pop in to um, 213 uh, in A building if you want to chat about your personal project or if you have um, um, any questions.